Today we're continuing in our study in the book of Ecclesiastes, and we're dealing with the subject, without God, everything is nothing. And today we're dealing with the danger of playing God. Have you ever done that? I hope not. Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verses 1 through 12, sometimes maybe in life, circumstances have availed that you feel like you could maybe run the universe a little bit better than God. Well, I'm going to tell you, I don't think we can and we will. Uh, we don't need to because God's totally, completely, and absolutely in control. Solomon reminds us that in your heart, we want to be like God. Our flesh, we, we're in a combat zone with flesh. And because we assume we can do a better job playing the divine part, actually, that was the first temptation. If you look at Genesis and the Garden of Eden and what happened to Eve and Adam, Adam and Eve, that's exactly the scenario that played out for them. Adam and Eve were not tempted to, to fall down. They were tempted to fall up. They wanted to take control. They wanted, by the direction and by the leadership of Satan and by listening to his schemes, of course, we know that they thought they could exalt themselves. But realize the one that came and tempted them is also the one that thought, if you read the book of Isaiah, that thought he could exalt himself above Almighty God. And that's why God removed Lucifer from his presence and his angels that followed him and, of course, cast him out into the second heaven. Now, the serpent told them if, if they would eat of the tree, uh, the fruit of the tree, then they would be like God. Adam and Eve were greatly mistaken. You know, you never, it never pays to listen to the devil, does it? He will mislead you, and he will do everything that he can to throw you off track. And today, there's a great danger in trying to play God in our lives that we try to usurp our authority over God. But unfortunately, we make the decisions without consulting the Lord. I found in uh, my life, as we have, Cynthia and I, as I pray you have too, you're far better off consulting God in all your decisions and seeking his guidance. And you know what's so amazing about him. He will surely direct your paths and give you the right way to go. But you've got to, you've got to trust him. You've got to seek him while, while he may be found. We forget God sees a big picture that we do not see. We just see particles and specks in the spectrum of our life. God sees the entire picture. He sees the end from the beginning from the end. He knows exactly what's going to happen tomorrow. You and I have not gotten there yet, but I'm glad that he does have a sufficiency of grace to get us to that place. And when we get to tomorrow, his grace will be sufficient for that too. But realizing God has and understands, and he already knows the future. As a matter of fact, he even knows the day, the hour, the second in which his son, the Lord Jesus Christ will come back. Now, not even the angels in heaven know that. And only God, the father knows that. But I sure am looking forward to that day when he does come. How about you? But our perspective is limited to the life here and now. But God has the past, the present, and the future at his disposal. He can look back. He can look into the present. And he can see what is down the path for us in the future. So when God sends us a signal, it, it's wise for us then to obey the Lord. That's the leadership of what we call the Holy Spirit. It's the leadership that he directs and shows us in which way we should go. You never go wrong by trusting and listening to the Lord, do you? Amen. So understand this, that even in times of valleys or whether it's in seasons of victories today, trials or possibly triumphs today, God always knows what's best for your life. Amen. And when you trust him with your life today, Folks, your life will go a lot better. That doesn't mean that you're going to be problematically free. No, you're going to have problems. Everybody's going to have situations. But man, you get through what you face a whole lot better with God on your side than trying to do it by yourself. So we're not more equipped at being God than God himself. He knows all things. Three things he possesses. First, he possesses, he's omnipresent. It means he's everywhere all the time. You and I can't do that. Secondly, He's omnipotent. He possesses all power in heaven and in earth. We don't have that, but we have ex exposure to that through God. That's why we can proclaim, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Third thing is, he's omniscient. 
He is an all-knowing God. He knows all things. Well, you know, I've always found you're far better to listen to people that know a lot. And let me tell you something. You're far better to listen to God who knows all things. Amen. So listen to him. He'll never lead you in the wrong path. Now in Ecclesiastes 6, Solomon drives basically three points that include these areas. Work, wealth, and wisdom that will give us the ability to be our own God. So understand, no gift God gives can be, can be enjoyed apart from a relationship with God. Those things, work, wisdom, and, and uh, wealth, you can't acquire those on your own. There are no self-made people. Everything that we have is a gift from God. God even lets us breathe his air, his oxygen on his earth. So you think about it, that we have been bought with a price, therefore we should glorify God in our being, right? And we should exalt him. Now there are three reasons for trying to play God uh, over your life. And you've got to be cautious of these things. So the first thing that we're going to look at today, riches will not give you peace. There's a lot of wealthy people in this world, but you know what? A lot of those wealthy people don't have any peace in their heart. And the amazing thing is that wealth just necessitates more wealth. They're never satisfied. They always want more. There's never enough. People think that if they can just be rich enough, they can control all the factors that lead to our happiness. Well, you may find some temporary happiness in riches, but you will not find eternal joy in riches. The joy that God gives us comes from him, and it comes from a relationship in him. We go to Ecclesiastes 6, 1 and 2, and uh, Solomon wrote some pretty profound stuff here. Listen to what he says. There's an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it's coming among men. A man to whom God had given riches, wealth, and honor, so that he, would, so he wanted nothing for his soul of all that he desireth. Yet God giveth him not power to eat thereof, but a stranger eateth it. This is vanity, and it, and it is any evil disease. Now, what, is do, what Solomon's doing here is he creates for us a fictitious person, a fictitious man who has all this money, all this wealth, all these riches to buy whatever he wants, yet he's unable to enjoy any of that. Have you ever noticed that people that just cannot get enough of the world are never satisfied? When you got Jesus Christ, you got all the satisfaction you need. He will satisfy your soul. Could it be that maybe this, and I was thinking about this, is Solomon somewhat reflecting or referring to himself in this particular passage? Possibly could be. Solomon wanted for nothing, but he kept pursuing. People, they, they fall for the lie that a bank account can control your destiny. Well, I'm going to tell you, like I said last week, or said recently, there are no U-Hauls attached to a hearse. You can't take with you the things of this world. There's only one thing you can send ahead. And that, of course, is the fact that you've received Christ and that you've won souls for his kingdom. That's the most important thing we can do. So you've got to get this in your spirit. Riches will not give you peace. Only God can give you peace. In all the turmoil that we're living in in this world, you know, we can have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. But that, again, comes through a relationship with the Lord. Nobody can truly enjoy the gifts of God apart from the God who gives the gift. So anything that God provides for you that you can enjoy, you've got to include God in the scope of what you're enjoying. And, you know, God is enjoyable. He's just great to be with. Amen. And he wants to share his blessings with us today. To enjoy the gift without the giver, let me tell you what it is. It's idolatry. We are worshiping the, the things of this world, the, the, the material things, more than we're worshiping the one that gives us all things. So we've got to get our priorities right. We've got to seek the Lord first, right? So enjoyment without God is merely entertainment and it doesn't satisfy that's why the people that just continually claw for more and more and more in this world, they never get all they want because they are not satisfied. 
Boy, I'll tell you what, when you've got the Lord in your life and you've got the peace of salvation and you know God's with you, for you, and sees you through every trial and obstacle that you face, you can have a great peace. You can sleep good at night and you can wake up rejoicing in the Lord because you know great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Enjoyment with God is enrichment and it brings true joy and it brings true satisfaction. So our problem is, we focus more of our attention on the gift from heaven rather than from the giver from heaven. We ought to thank God in all things. And that's what the word says, that we should thank him in everything. Well, preacher, I'm not going to thank him for the valleys. Why? Because God brings, God brings victory through those valleys. He brings enlightenment. He brings direction. And even in the valleys we go through, we may not thank the Lord for the pain we've gone through, but we can thank God for the growing experience that we have gained through that in knowing that we've got a God who's with us. Aren't you glad? We've got such a God that, is, that will never leave you nor forsake you, who has promised to be a constant friend and companion, who will never let you down, who will get you through whatever you're going through. That's the promise that we have from the Lord. So money does not serve as our security and our peace. You can't buy God and buy eternity. It comes through a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Only God can give you the ability actually to enjoy wealth. Now, I know people who have uh, been blessed with a lot. And you know what? They, they recognize where the gift came from. And they give God honor and glory for it. And they, they are free from the standpoint that they give back unto the Lord. They just can't seem to stop just giving back to the Lord and thanking him for what they have been given. You say, well, preacher, I don't have a lot of money and all these other things. Let me tell you, if you've got a relationship with God, you've got a good family, and you've got a little health, and you've got, you know, a little, little um, life that, that's enjoyable, you can praise God for that. I mean, you can thank God for the little things. And maybe if we would learn to thank him more for the little things, maybe God then would grace us more with larger things. See, he only gives you what you can be responsible for. And so therefore, we've got to be responsible to give God praise in all things. So we can only appreciate our wealth when God is our security and our joy in life. Now, riches will not give you peace. It's a poor substitute. It will never give you the joy of the Lord. And again, God gives us the wealth. Therefore, he, 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 we, we need him in our lives to enjoy it. Don't leave God out. Keep him included in what's going on in your life. With God, you have peace even if you lose your wealth. I mean, I've known people that lost it all, but they didn't lose their salvation. They didn't lose their relationship. They didn't lose their walk, and they still gave God glory. And you know what? God restored them, and God blessed them. And this is the wild thing. He even blessed them greater. Look at Job. Job lost family. Job lost wealth. Job lost everything, but he never lost God. And what did God do? He blessed him greater in chapter 42 after he went through all of that than he was blessed before. All the wealth he had, the great family, 10 kids, everything else, all the cattle and everything. God gave him even greater. God brought him through. You know why God permitted him to go through that? Because God could trust him that he would keep his focus on the Lord. Folks, if your focus is on materialism, wealth, and the world, I'm going to tell you, God can't trust you. He can only trust you when you put him first in your life. Amen. So with God, you have peace, and that peace today, it is greater than anything else that you can have in your life. Solomon gives us a pointed illustration moving on in verses 3 through 6. He says, if a man begat a hundred children and lived many years so that the days of his years be many and his soul be not filled with good and also that he hath no burial, I say that an untimely birth is better than he. For he cometh in with vanity and departeth in darkness and his name shall be covered with darkness. Moreover, he hath not seen the sun nor known anything. This hath more rest than the other. Yea, uh, though he live a thousand years twice told, yet hath he seen no good, do not all go to one place. So 
In this account, Solomon then depicts another fictitious person, man. And Solomon's saying that life without God is worse than never living at all. And you think about that. Life without God, really, God is our life. He not only gives us physical life, but he gives us eternal life. And thank the Lord, his eternal life is given through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. This man does not have a proper relationship with his children. This man has a big family. He, he's lived a, a long time. He's got all the riches and things of the world, but he won't enjoy any of them because he has not sought God's help. You need the help of the Lord in your life every day. Solomon's saying that this life on earth ends with death. And we know that. It's appointed unto man once to die, the word of God says. Our life is as vapor. It appears for a little while, it vanishes away. So this life on this earth will end one day by death, but wealth is a burden without God. Actually, I mean, you may think, well, preacher, give me a lot of wealth and I'll see how it goes. I'm going to tell you, when it all comes down to it, you're going to find out if you've got all the wealth in the world and you don't have God, it's a burden. Amen. I mean, you can have the, the finest money to buy the finest food, but if you don't have an appetite to eat it, it's not worth a plug nickel, is it? Amen. You can't use God to get riches. A lot of times people make promises to God. Well, God, if you'll give me this, I'll do that. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, you're wasting your time in God's time. Because God's not, he, he's not going to be in the best of the deal mentality. He's not going to give you door one, two, and three. He's not going to give you the option of curtain one, two, or three. He's, he's not going to let you go through a charade of things. God, listen, he blesses you when you have learned to bless him. So you cannot use God to get riches. Actually, we should give all the glory to God for everything that we have. We should draw our security day from God so that, he, that we can be satisfied only in him and in his presence. So here's the bottom line. Riches and or wealth will not make you like God. I mean, there's a lot of people that may think, well, I got a lot of this and I got a lot of that and I got a lot of money and fame and fortune and stuff, stuff like that. But that doesn't make you God. It doesn't exalt you. I mean, you know, you put your trousers on just like everybody else, one leg at a time. <laughs> you may think you've got prestige and power, but let me tell you what, compared to God, you're not even a squeak. Amen. If, if your walk with God is consumed with wondering when the big paycheck, when God's going to make it happen, and when it's going to come in, you're drawing your security on the wrong thing. People go out every day and run to these convenience stores and gas stores and, and um, uh, grocery stores and chunk money into machines or stand at the counter and buy gobs of these lottery tickets that we think, I, if I could only hit the mega million, if I can only get the big one, I mean, there's X amount of money in that thing. Well, you better, you better survey first your chances of winning and your chances are already just beyond and off the shelf. Listen, folks, all you're doing is throwing, you might as well go out in the street, take all your money, and just throw it up in the air because you're just throwing it in the wind. You're wasting it because that's not going to bring you in. Well, yeah, but preacher, I won a dollar for the last, all right. That's still, you're not going to get rich on a buck. I mean, don't, don't be drawn into that, that web of thinking, boy, if I can't, I, I'm just, I mean, I've got a, a guy that lives in the street for me. And I mean, he's conjured up every number that he can conjure up on playing pick three, pick four, mega million, all this other crazy stuff. And he stopped me the other day. He said, I'll tell you, if I had just gone with the numbers that, that uh, I had written down, I would have won $10,000. I said, did you win? No, I didn't. I said, man, it's a chance. Your chance of winning, I'm going to tell you, is slim and none. You know, get out here and invest your money in something that will return a bigger yield to you. And that is invest your money in the kingdom of God. Invest your life in the work of the Lord. That brings a far greater yield. And this is, this is one, this is the gift that just keeps on giving. <laughs> you know, you'll get rewarded and blessed here and you'll get rewarded and blessed there too. 
You'll never go wrong. Folks, listen, if you walk with God and you consume with trying to get, 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 your focus is wrong. Don't play God. Today, trust God instead. That's a far better, far better way to live. Second thing, responsibility will not give you purpose. And that's a very important word within the ranks of Christianity. Uh, verse 7 of Ecclesiastes 6 says, All the labor of man is for his mouth, and yet the appetite is not filled. Now that's a, that's a beautiful analogy or an illustration that Solomon gives us here. Many of us, by working hard and fulfilling our daily responsibilities, we try to find purpose for getting out of bed in the morning. You know why you get out? Because you got to get up and go earn that paycheck and to get, uh, get that money to pay your bills, right? But in verse 7, the word appetite, this is interesting. Did a little research on this. The word appetite is often translated in the Old Testament as soul. So your hard work, you, you work hard. You work diligently, but your soul is still not satisfied. There are folks out there that are working and working and working themselves to death to gain, to get, to get, and they never get enough. And unfortunately, they are ignoring their soul. They're ignoring their relationship with God. And you know what? When you do that, you always come up short. So working hard is necessary maybe for food, but it doesn't give you purpose in life. Solomon's saying working hard without God in your life is both, it's frustrating and it's actually also, it's foolish too. So if your purpose is tied to your career today, you may achieve much, but sooner or later, all of that's going to be gone. All the riches and stuff that we lay up, folks, it's going to be gone. It has no value. This doesn't does not give you eternal significance when it comes to God. For it's God who gives us purpose. It's God that gives us a design for our life that we can live and have the peace of God. So God's glory is the key to living your life. Because if your life is about glorifying him, I'm going to tell you, you're living in the purpose of God. And the purpose of God will necessitate and bring about the will of God. And you know what? You'll be honoring God and God's going to be blessing you. It's simple. I can't understand why Christians can't grab this. They run crazy. So many Christians are working hard and they're working themselves to death. But honestly, as the old saying goes, they're not working smart. They're not serving God. If you're not careful, our ambition can get the best of us. And we totally forget that our purpose is rooted in the Lord. So don't, don't get so wrapped up in yourself that you don't have time for God. You don't have time for the house of the Lord. You don't have time to pray and to read your Bible. Don't, don't let your identity be tied to yourself, but let your identity uh, be tied to Christ because it's only him today that makes you who you are and changes your life. There, there's so much more to the value of the soul than what we do in that daily routine of life. Our purpose is not rooted in ourselves. I've listened to story after story, uh, people who have been great athletes or people who were involved in great things uh, recently I was reading a story about an athlete that he was very prominent, he was very big and he was very well known and you know one day he came to a reality check and he was nothing but pursuant of the millions and millions and millions of dollars today he's working in a camp changing the lives of kids because God changed his life his priority is no longer on finances and money and gaining and getting and bigger, bigger, bigger his now his focus is upon the kingdom of God. Oh, it was a powerful testimony. Don't reduce your existence to only what you can do because we have limitations, but God has no limitations, amen. God never intended that work be our ultimate purpose in life, amen. The purpose of our life is to God, for God to be glorified in our living, that he is to be exalted. Our life is about him. And I know your flesh is gonna say, uh-uh, my life's about me. It's about numero uno. It's about number one. It's about me. No, it's not. Because without God, you can even breathe. Without God, you wouldn't even have a, you wouldn't even, you couldn't even live on his earth. You, you couldn't claim anything. It's God that gave you the power to, to get up and to go this morning. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Ecclesiastes 2 and 10 says, for we are his workmanship, Ephesians, I rather, Ephesians 2 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, 
which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now, God has a good work and he wants us to pursue it. And you never go wrong with serving the Lord. Blinded ambition will cause you to lose sight of the Lord in your life. You can get sidetracked so easily. Don't care more about the blessing than you care about the one who gives the blessing. Because he's the one that's worthy of our praise. Going back to Ecclesiastes 6 and verse 8. For what hath the wise more than the fool? For what hath the poor that knoweth to walk before the living? In this verse, Solomon shifts from hard work to education. And no, don't misunderstand me. I'm a, an advocate of, of higher education. And we need to, to gain every bit of education we can get. But Solomon's saying you can have the greatest education today in the world. But if God's not in your life, you're better off as a fool. <laughs> education is never, here, education is never a substitute for God. Amen. Going on to verse 9, better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the desire. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. So Solomon is bringing us to the place. He said, it's better to have a few things and enjoy them than to have and dream of a lot of things and never receive any of them. Hallelujah. Have you learned to enjoy what God's already given you? Amen. You know, a lot of times we don't get more because we haven't thanked God for what he's already given us. And we haven't utilized the gifts that he's already provided for us. You, you have to be careful of working so hard to prepare for your future that you fail to live for God in the present. Man, listen, always put God first. That is biblical. That is scriptural today. Enjoy the blessings, though, that God's given you. It doesn't mean God wants you to sit around and look like you've licked the bottom of a churn and you sour grapes and you bite everybody's head off that comes by to see you and you think, I don't have nothing, so I'm going to be just as sour as I can be. I'm bitter. I'm bitter as gall. No, you know, you can make a choice. You can stay bitter or you can get better and beautiful. And I'm going to tell you, when you're bitter, you're ugly. When you're bitter, you're ugly. Amen. Oh, Lord, the preacher can call me ugly. Well, if you're bitter, you are. <laughs> but if you learn to thank God and praise God, you can today can be beautiful. You're beautiful. Look at you. Aren't you pretty? You're a pretty little thing, aren't you? Amen. Oh, thank you, brother. I'll take that. <laughs> Enjoy the blessing that God has given you. Recognize the gift and honor God for giving it to you. Honor God by utilizing the gifts and utilizing the blessings that he has provided in your life every day. Don't resent the life that God has provided and given you. God should be your purpose. And God should be your joy. Difference, I didn't say happiness, I said joy. Rest in God's sovereignty and realize today, God is still a good God. Amen. World's bad shape. God's still good. And you can even rejoice because the way things are looking, it looks like a rapture is about to occur. Hallelujah. But let God be God and, and, and live the purpose for which he has created you. Now, let me give you the third one real quick. Rebellion will not give you power. Everybody wants power. Kings and presidents and princes and all these people in, in world leadership, they want power. People in corporate business want power. People in our own lives want power. When you want to determine your own destiny, if you're not careful, you will dis dis we will disregard God by our willful disobedience. Verse 10, that which hath been is namely already, and it is known that it is a man, neither may he contend with him that is mightier than he. All right. What is Solomon pointing here? I'm going to make it real simple. God is a creator, and God's still in charge. It's not Vladimir Putin. It's not Barack Obama. It's not any other world leader. It's not these guys that's trying to win the office next month. God possesses all power in heaven and in earth. Hallelujah. As a matter of fact, that beautiful sun that you awakened to this morning... And you felt splash on you today as you were coming to church. And that 
wonderful fresh air that God provided for us to breathe and those birds that were singing and chirping and God provided all of that for you. So, you know, we're, we're blessed. We're blessed immensely today. You will never find peace and purpose in the things of this world. As a matter of fact, they're going to draw you away from God. As a matter of fact, they're going to make you sour. As a matter of fact, they're going to make you bitter. And you know what I told you about bitter? <laughs> so you, you cannot reduce God's power nor charge from the standpoint, God today, listen, God's plan, you will never today honor God by disobeying God. You've got to honor God through your obedience to him. You're, you cannot determine your own destiny. And in here other Sunday, I was mingled in with a message and my message about my testimony and how that what God had designed for us was different than what I had designed for myself. But I'm glad I was smart enough to listen to God and not my stupid self. So, you know, God does not share his control with anyone. God did not call me this morning to ask for uh, a consult about how to run the world. No, I called on him this morning about how to pastor and how to lead and how to bring you to a closer relationship with God. Amen. We need a healthy reminder that he's God, we're not. He's God, we are not. Rebelling against God does not make us more powerful. As a matter of fact, it makes you weaker. You cannot find a better way to live than the prescribed way, uh, God's prescribed way in his word. Then verse 11 says, seeing, seeing there be many things that increase vanity, what is man the better? You cannot dismiss what God says. You cannot ignore, well, I won't open the Bible and read it. Well, God still holds you responsible for it. <laughs> whether you read it or not, whether you look at it or not, whether you believe it or not, God still holds you responsible for it. So man does not have any advantage over God, and God does not need the advice of man. You can tell God what and what not to do, but let me tell you, it's not going to have any value. Because God is a sovereign God. And his ways, as Isaiah said, are higher than the heavens. So that means if I'm trying to do life my way, I'm living beneath. If I live life God's way, I'm living above. See, we're given that choice, aren't we? You can never explain away the scriptures to justify the rebellion that you live in day in and day out. And verse 12, as I close, For who knoweth what is good for man in this life all the days of his his vain life, which he uh, spendeth as a shadow. For who can tell a man what shall be after him under the sun? Be assured God knows what is good for you. And even though when we don't understand it, we have to trust God for it. You, you can't depend on the opinions of others. You can't base your life on gut feelings. You know, so many times we base our decisions on those things and anything else to guide you. What you've got to do is just look to God and his word. And you know what? God has never failed. And he's not about to start right now. We may not know what tomorrow holds, but we know who holds tomorrow. And that's crucially important for us to understand. So only God can offer you peace and purpose in life. It's always better to obey God rather than to rebel against God. Well, I'm bitter towards God. God didn't do this and God didn't do that. Well, let me tell you what. You're just doing nothing but hurting yourself with your own bitterness. Trust God. Repent. Get right. Live right. Stay right. And you'll be blessed right. Amen. So God's in a much better position to guide us than we ourselves. God loves you. And you know what? God has a plan for your life today. A plan today that you can trust him with all things. For God knows what he is doing. Amen. You ever get in those places and you just don't know what to do? <laughs> Trust God because he always knows what's best. He will lead you in paths of righteousness and he will take you beside the still waters and he will bless you beyond measure. That's our God today. Don't ever try to play God. It doesn't work. Father, thank you this morning for the precious word of God. Quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, you reveal in your word the purpose that you have for our life. You speak to us not only through the word, but you speak to us through the spirit of God, through our circumstances, through prayer. 
Help us to be attentive enough to listen to what you're trying to tell us. Help us to seek you and to love you and to live for you. Father, I pray today that your name will be honored and glorified in this place. I pray that you'll be lifted up and exalted. I just pray, Lord, for a mighty outpouring of, your, of you in this room throughout this day. And Lord, as we prepare our hearts for worship, I just pray the Spirit of God will just come down in such a, a living way that we, Lord, cannot miss it. Touch our hearts and draw us to a closer walk in relationship with you. Have your way, have your will to God be the glory and the praise in Jesus' name. And all God's servants said, amen. <laughs>